in the kitchen, there's no tool quite as important, quite as versatile, or quite as personal as a chef's knife. These tools are investments, and buying great chef's knives deserves some research and planning. So I was shocked to discover that nobody could tell me which of the most popular chef's knives performs the best. If you search for best chef knives, you'll find plenty of answers, but almost no objective data. What's up with that? Highly respected publications like Bon Appetit, America's Test Kitchen, Serious Seats, New York Times, they all publish best chef's knife guides, and these guides go into great detail uh, about the reviewer's preferences, their likes and dislikes, their experience testing various blades, and that is great. Do you know what they don't provide? Numbers. No graphs, no charts, no CSV downloads, no objective measurements on how these knives actually perform when cutting food. But hey, I get it, right? Making objective measurements of a knife would be really hard. First, you couldn't really have a human do the cutting because humans aren't very repeatable. You would need something like a robot arm to replicate an exact cutting motion over and over again. Hi, <laughs> I'm Scott, and I am an obsessive guy with a robot arm. But I used to have a normal job. Long ago, I worked at IBM and Microsoft making business intelligence software to slice, dice, and analyze data. I quit my job in tech to work for Modernist Cuisine, the culinary research lab and creators of the award-winning 50-pound books on the science of cooking. There, I got to learn some amazing stuff. I wrote software for focus stack macro photography. I developed a recipe for laser etched tortillas. What the hell are these? These are tortillas. And I built a bunch of robots to help the team collect data to better understand how cooking processes worked. But my passion is helping home cooks get access to the best tools and techniques to make great cooking feel effortless. Back when sous vide machines cost $1,200, I published plans for a $75 DIY version. <laughs> and then co-founded Sanzair to produce one of the first affordable home machines. Years later, I joined Anova as their chief innovation officer and helped develop the world's first home combi oven, a $6,000 oven in a $600 package. In all of these projects, there was an opportunity to help home cooks through science, technology, and engineering. And that's exactly why I started Seattle Ultrasonics. We're on a mission to make a better night. But first, we have to answer the question, better than what? The Quantified Knife Project is an ambitious first attempt to bring more data into the world of kitchen knives. Not just to help rank their performance, but hopefully to uncover some insights into how to make a better knife better. So here's what we did. First, we selected 21 of the most popular chef's knives out there. These are a mix of knives recommended by cooking websites, favorites of the chef's knife subreddit, top sellers on Amazon, and a few blades you've likely seen in Facebook or Instagram ads. And I should note that we paid full price for each of these knives, and the manufacturers didn't even know we were conducting these tests. They're finding out right now. Then, straight out of the box, we measured the sharpness of these blades using the best test. The lower the number, the sharper the blade. This test is a very handy proxy for measuring sharpness. Quick, and I love that I can compare my measurements before and after sharpening, or versus some other knife enthusiast across the internet. 109 this time. Wow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> 109. Oh, now that is sharp. <laughs> but the best test measures how easily you can cut through a filament, not how easily you can cut through a tomato. Next, while the factory edges of each blade were still pristine, we wanted to take some pictures. After all, when you're shopping for a knife, you want to get a good close look at the blade edge, but there's a problem. If you use a high magnification macro lens and zoom way in to get an up-close photo of a knife blade, 
something weird happens. You can barely see any of it. This is because of something called depth of field. In ordinary photography, where the subjects that we're shooting are much larger than the sensor on our cameras, this isn't a big deal. It's pretty easy to make everything in focus. But when you're trying to shoot very, very tiny things, it's annoying and it's unavoidable. So we used a technique called focus stacking to work around this limitation. In focus stacking, rather than take a single picture, we take dozens and in between each one, we nudge the point of focus ever so slightly. Now these nudges are really tiny, fractions of a micron in some cases. So I built a computerized focus stacking rig out of a high precision linear stepper motor, a microcontroller, and some custom firmware and software I wrote. A typical stack for an edge-on image like this one might require 60 or so individual photos, so automation was key. Once we'd captured all the frames for each image, we'd load them into a special program that combines only the in-focus parts of each frame. The final output is a high-magnification picture that is totally in focus and doesn't sacrifice detail for depth of field. I didn't tell you. I was obsessive. Now that the factory edges have been thoroughly documented, it's time to cut some food. We chose five different foods for testing. Tomatoes, potatoes, carrots, cheddar cheese, and soft bread rolls. Next, it was time to teach the robot how to cut. Since the whole idea here is to design a test that replicates the experience of human cutting, but without the human involved, we needed our robot to move like a chef. So we analyzed videos of professional chefs to see how their knives move in a slice cut. For tomatoes, potatoes, and bread, we used this slicing motion. For carrots and cheese, we used a push cutting motion since that's more typical of the way those foods would be cut. Okay, we've got our inputs, our knives, our food samples, and our robotic cutting movements. All that's left is the output, measuring how much force it takes to cut through each food. Luckily, the company that makes this robot also sells a six axis force sensor that attaches to the end effector except it's $4,000, so that's not going to work. Instead, we decided on a simpler approach, a scale. Now, this is a really, really good scale. It's a high-precision digital laboratory balance, accurate to a tenth of a gram, and it has a serial interface so we can stream its weighing data to a computer. But this approach means that we're only capturing the downward forces exerted during cutting. We're not measuring any side-to-side -side forces. But for the slice cuts, the sideways forces ought to be pretty minimal, and for the push cuts, they're zero. So I think this simplification is good enough. To keep the food steady, we designed and 3D printed these platforms that fit on the scale. The spiky parts keep the food from rolling away during the tests, and this U-shaped groove here lets the knife push all the way through the food without ever contacting a hard surface. In fact, when we put each knife on the robot, we ran an automatic calibration to determine the ending point of the cut just to ensure we weren't bottoming out the blade and risking potential damage, or worse, contamination of our results by blunting the blade. Finally, it was cutting time. I locked myself in this room for two days with the air conditioning set to refrigerator temperatures, and I fed the robot over and over and over again changing and aligning knives, wiping the blades clean and dry between each test, capturing the data, and repeating the process for 525 trials. In the end, we gathered over 100,000 data points, and this is where things get really interesting. The main question we set out to answer was, how do these knives objectively perform when cutting actual food? And I'll get to that in just a moment, but first, let's take a peek at the raw cutting data. Here's a tomato chart. This one happens to be for the Shun Classic knife, but they all look something like this. Our y-axis shows the force recorded during the test, and the x-axis shows the depth of the cut as the robot does its cutting motion. The filled-in white areas are each individual trial for this knife, and by overlaying them, we can see how similar or different the results were across the five tomatoes in this trial. This blue line represents the average of those five trials, 
and the white dotted line represents the top performing knife for tomato cutting. So we've got something to compare to. But what interests me is the shape of these curves. We see there's a relatively large buildup of force as we start the cut. This is the knife pushing harder and harder until it breaks through the tomato skin. Then the force drops way off. And this matches our human experience of cutting tomatoes. A dull knife takes a lot of force to initiate the cut, while a sharp knife makes it seem effortless. So the key metric we're using to judge these tomato tests is peak force, the maximum force exerted before breaking through the skin. Cheese, on the other hand, has very different dynamics. There's no skin to pierce. There's just a friction game, a slow and steady accumulation of force as more and more of the blade sinks into the food. And this also matches our human experience of pressing a knife through a block of cheese. So the key metric we chose for cheese cubes is total force, the area under this curve. Potatoes are a little different too. There's a thin skin to break through, and then force builds up as the cross section of the potato gets wider and wider until you pass its equator and the forces start to drop off. So for potatoes, we use average force as our key metric. Now, you might expect carrots and potatoes to behave similarly, and at first glance, they do. But if we look closer, you'll see that carrot cutting has two distinct phases. First, we're pushing the knife into the carrot like a wedge, building up force until finally the carrot cracks. It cleaves open and the force drops off until you finish the cut. And for the final test, we've got bread. Admittedly, Hawaiian rolls are a strange test for bread cutting. In the real world, a better test might be slicing coins off of a crusty baguette. But there are two problems with that. First, baguettes aren't homogenous. Their crust near the ends is totally different from their crust at the middle. And second, I needed over a hundred identical samples. And the only identical breads that Costco carried in that quantity were pre-sliced hot dog buns, hamburger buns, and trusty Hawaiian dinner rolls. But the bread data still tell us an interesting story. Most of the knives squished the bread as they sliced it. Uh, but there's still a considerable difference in the range of forces they took to complete the cut. Some knives made much easier work of the bread than others. So we used maximum force as our metric for the bread test. I find all of this fascinating food cutting isn't just one thing. These graphs show that the dynamics are different from food to food. And even though we tried to cover a wide range in these tests, I suspect we'd learn even more from cutting onions, from slicing fish, from breaking down squash or chopping herbs. But back to our original research question. How do these knives stack up? To calculate the results, we took each knife's score across the food cutting tests and ranked them, first place, second place, and so on. Then we took each knife's ranking across all foods and averaged them. This blended score is what we call a food cutting rank. It's a measure of overall performance. It's by no means the only way you could score these knives, but it captures how easily a knife cuts food in general relative to the other knives in this group. But here's what blew our minds. I expected the top knives in the group to excel across the board, that we would be able to say, these knives perform better than the others, full stop. That's not what we found. Instead, with very few exceptions, we found that there weren't clear-cut winners across the board. A knife that excelled on potatoes and tomatoes totally tanked the carrot test. A blade that aced bread, carrots, and potatoes put up unimpressive scores for tomatoes and cheese. In fact, when we ran a statistical analysis of these results, we found that the performance on one food didn't predict the performance on another. And in the realm of scientific experiments, this is the most exciting result you can discover because it makes you say, huh, that's strange. There's way more to analyze than what I've presented here, including results from Catra edge retention testing, the relationship between price and cutting performance, edge angles, and a lot more. So we've created a comprehensive online resource where you can dive into the results yourself. 
each knife is presented in full detail with highlights on its performance written by an actual human. And if you want to dig deeper, the full data are available open source on GitHub. The goal here isn't to tell you which knife to buy. The goal of the Quantified Knife Project is to give you the tools to make an informed decision based on what matters most to you, and to start a discussion about bringing more objective data to a field that's often relied on proxy tests, subjective opinions, and marketing hype. It's not about finding the best knife. It's about understanding what makes cutting work so we can make knives better. In the coming videos, we'll dive deeper into more surprising stories revealed in the data. So subscribe if you want to follow along with our discoveries. Thanks for joining me on a journey way off the deep end and happy cooking.